Well, we are delighted today to welcome a very dear friend who's been in partnership with us for a long time, Sever Banda, who is bringing us a message of hope from Africa. Sever is the director of the Holistic Evangelism Project in the Tet province of Mozambique. And so, Sever, I just want to welcome you to Woodside. And uh, I'll ask you to please let's join me in welcoming you. So I thought we could begin by having you tell us a little bit about yourself, you, you know, your background, your education, and uh, we even have a picture of your family here, so there's, there's Sever's nice family. That's, so go ahead, share, share a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, thank you so much uh, for turning out to come to church today. Um, my name is Seba Banda. I grew up in Zambia, um, the central part of Africa. I have uh, two children, my son Nancy and Adam, and um, they are in college right now. My son is 26, and Nancy is uh, 22, and I thank God uh, that God has seen me through to raise them. Uh, I lost my husband um, when my daughter was three weeks old. He died in an accident, and I've raised my children through God's grace to where they are today, and I'm grateful to God. I was educated in Zambia. I did nursing in Zambia, and then I did midwifery, and then I went um, for public health, and then I did project management. That's my education background. And again, um, I was called to do the Lord's work. So I moved from nursing to do what I'm doing today. And how did you get involved with the Holistic Evangelism Project? It's because of the love that I had for the Lord. I was working in the hospitals, and I was seeing the need of the people in the communities. And I felt I needed to do more to the less privileged people, unlike what I was doing in the cities, where people are able to afford to do most of the things they can offer, they can do other things because they are working, they have an income. But I had a heart to help the less privileged people in the community. So when I heard of the holistic ministry, it caught my eye, and I wanted to be with them, and then I applied, and then they accepted me. So my calling is to work for the privileged. So I get into the ministry because I had a call to save the privileged and my love for the Lord. Thank you. And so let's hear a little bit about Africa. Now, Woodside, you've been recently supporting work in Zambia, which is where Sebra was actually from. Uh, and if you look on this map, you can see the, the circle, the oval, is around the country of Mozambique, which is where she works now. But just to the left of it and um, a little north is the country of Zambia. Uh, you recently helped uh, renovate a school in Zambia and provide for evangelists there, a water project there. But today we're going to be looking at Mozambique. And so Mozambique is in another, uh, is over towards the coast. Here's a larger picture of it. And then the Tet province is in the box. That's where Seber does her work. So can you tell us a little bit about, um, about Mozambique? Mozambique is um, on the coast, on the Indian Ocean. It's in the southeast part of Africa. But we mostly work in Tete province. Mozambique is big. So we are only working in Tete province. I was born in Zambia. I stay in Malawi, but I work in Mozambique. So it's... It's between the three countries, but I'm grateful. Uh, Mozambique uh, was at war for 16 years. Some of you that know the history, they were colonized by Portugal. And then for 16 years, they were fighting. So when the Portuguese people left, they started fighting among themselves. So there was civil war again for another eight years in the country. So there was much of destruction in the country and people went out of their country to go to the, nearby, um, the neighboring countries like Zambia, Malawi, and, Mozamb and uh, Zimbabwe. So this is an area where people are just going back to their city after war. And you can imagine after war what war can do to an area. So we are talking of an area where most of the things were destroyed, their homes, the churches, the schools, and the hospitals. So we are just starting to do that for them because they've gone back there, but they don't have the basics that they can be able to use. 
So we are trying our best to be able to help them build churches and then schools, hospitals, and uh, also on the health part of them because hospitals are far apart in the area. When you talk of a hospital, you are talking about 20 or 30 miles away from your home. And so let's look at some of those uh, churches. Now, uh, this is an amazing picture. Every dot on this map is a church that's part of Seber's work. So tell us about those. Uh, those are the churches that we've done. Um, years back, when they just started the project, they were founders of the project. Um, I came in in 2005, and uh, they started in 1996, 97. They started with only four churches. But now we are talking of eight churches that we have done through your support. So we are so grateful for the support that you give us. But these churches are only managed by two pastors. Two pastors. But I've, seen, I've gone to churches here where you have four pastors, five pastors in one church. But our churches are manned by two pastors. So they divide the churches among themselves. So you can imagine, which means one pastor manages 40 churches. So they cannot manage to go to 40 churches every Sunday. So that's how we came up with a program where we train the elders to be lay pastors so that they can be able to help the pastors run the churches on a Sunday. And I thought I had a hard job. <laughs> 80, <not. laughs> 80 churches, two pastors. That's amazing. So um, uh, are there any plans to train or ordain more pastors for these churches? Yes, we dream of having more pastors because the churches are there and we don't have the pastors. But the challenge that we are having is the funds. Because for one to be trained to be a pastor, one needs to go to school. So most of the people, they want to go and be pastors, but they don't have the funding for them to go to school. Because for you to go to school, you have to have funds. So um, if we can have people willing to train, we have young men and women that want to be pastors, but we don't have the funding. So if we can have that, and again, if we, you can help us with the few that are there that are willing to do the work, but they are not ordained. If you help us, then we can be able to help them so that they are ordained, and then start helping us with the churches that we have there. So how does a, a community start a church? Like, how would they begin, even without a pastor? What would be the first thing they would do? They start mobilizing themselves uh, because we want them to feel part of the church. We don't want whereby we build the church for them and then they feel it was done by someone else. So they won't take care of it. So we want them to feel part of it. So what we do is we tell them to mold bricks and then they bring the stones, the sand, and then only the things that they cannot buy in the villages, they are the ones that we ask you to help us with some funds and then we are able to go and buy cement, the rafters, and uh, iron sheets, and pay labor for the, pe for the person that is going to construct. So them themselves, they have to have a heart of wanting that church themselves. So first, they bring all the materials to the site. When they've done that, I go and inspect. When I see that the materials are enough, then that's when I can send a message to you here to say, people are ready to build a church and you send us the funds. When you send the funds, then we are able to buy the materials and the church, the church starts from there. So here they are making the bricks for the, for the church. Mm -hmm. And then uh, here's a picture of what the church looks like when they first start, before they have the building. It's basically a, a mm -hmm. grass thatched mm -hmm. shelter. Um, yes. Yeah, and then, and then they, build, they use the bricks, they build the bricks. And here's that same church now. You can still see the grass shelter on the right. And this is the church getting ready for the roof, the iron sheets that are going to be the roof and all that. Yes, so um, when we have a structure like that one, many people come because it's visible. People want to go to church, but when they see that thatched grass, they think maybe people are just having their own things or traditional things. But when they have a big structure like that one, it attracts many people to come to church. And uh, right now, um, the congregation was saying that they had 150. But the ones that have registered now, they are coming up to 250. So we are grateful for the people that have helped us this year. It's not done yet this year to do that big church. And that's the only church that we have done which is big. To us, it's big, that one. 
The rest of them, they are small. So we are grateful, we are getting somewhere. In the past, we used to do 10 by seven, but now we are going into 15 by 20 churches. So we are growing and we are so thankful for the support that you're giving us. Now, how many want to build bricks out there? How many of you all would like to join? <laughs> Let's uh, look at schools. You also put in schools in the area. Yes, um, schools are far apart in our communities. We have the students, but the schools are not there. So when the parents organize themselves, they make a thatched uh, grass structure, and then students go to that. So most of the times when the rains come, the kids run, the teachers run, and again, kids get demotivated to go to schools because they feel they'll be on the sun and sitting on the rocks, it's not comfortable. So some of them would drop out. Some would thrive and go there. Like myself, when I was growing up, we were going to the same such school, but you would walk. You would get up early in the morning, like 5 a.m. in the morning, and then you walk maybe four hours walking, five hours to school, and then another five hours back and you can imagine there are no paved roads. And there, there's no vehicle. So you have to walk to and from. So it's not easy. If you don't have that heart for school, you can drop out. But when you have the heart for school, this is where I am today, like myself. You have to persevere and uh, go through that. And today, you are happy because you are educated and you are able to share that to other people and motivate them to do more and be where you are. Now, do these schools, they go all the way up to uh, what we call high school or secondary school, or they, they just go up to uh, below high school? Um, we have primary schools. Primary school? Yes, okay. and then we have the high school. So you go to primary, and then you go into high school, then you go into college. But the ones that we are doing right now, we haven't reached a level where we are doing the colleges, so we are just doing the primary schools. So that's a primary school. It has three blocks and then the office for the teachers. So when we have a structure like that one, teachers are attracted to go to our communities because the school is there and they feel proud to teach there. But the first ones, you come today and tomorrow they don't come, the teachers. So again, it has an impact on the students not to do well because the teachers will be there today, tomorrow they won't be there. So when we have a structure like that one, then we come back to you and ask for more support so that the teachers can stay at the school. The government provides the teachers. We, we build the school, and then we hand it over to the government. But the government gives us teachers. They are willing to teach, but there's no house. So they still go back to the city. And for them to come to teach at our schools, again, they walk five, maybe 20 miles away from where they are renting to come to the school. So again, we have a challenge whereby they don't come to the schools. So we build again a house for them, so that they can stay close to the school and be able to stay there and teach and only go to the city on a weekend when they are not teaching. So we are so grateful for what you are helping us to do in our communities and it's changing many lives. Now you have healthcare clinics that you provide as well. Um, what kinds of uh, patients do you serve? Um, it's both, uh, those that are sick and also we do maternity under five. Um, this, change, this clinic was built by Lake Square in Florida. When they came to visit, they found that uh, we were treating patients under the tree. The government would give um, supplies and uh, medications to see the patient on mobile uh, services, but there's no structure. So they thought of helping us with the clinic and we built that one. At first when we built it, we didn't even have power. Mothers would come there to deliver but there's no power in the night. So they would want to wait, and you know as ladies, you can't wait for labor until another day. So it was very, very, very challenging. So that's how I came back here and shared the story that we have women that come to the clinics, and I don't know why, I don't know how God created. Most of the times labor starts at night. I don't know, maybe here it's different, but mostly labor starts in the night. And you can imagine if it starts in the night for you to walk to a clinic. And when we are talking of a clinic, we are talking of 30, 50 miles away from your house. There's no car, there's no paved road. So you have to use a bicycle or an ox cart. You can imagine you're in labor and then you go on a bicycle. For sure, 
you won't reach the hospital, the 20 miles, you deliver in between. And what happens if you deliver in between without a medical personnel? Something can happen, you might bleed and die, or the baby will die. So we thought of a way in which we can help, that's how we built that. And again, we still have more, more communities without a clinic. So we thought of a way in which we can be able to help. So we train the local women in the villages. When we train them, we give them the bathing kits. When we give them the kits, when a woman is in labor, they can easily call up that lady to help them. And then after everything is done, it's just a clean delivery, not sterile. Clean. So when it's done, then they help them to go to a nearby clinic. That one now, they have to suffer the mouse because they have to be screened or examined by medical personnel after they've given delivery. These ones we teach, they are just the basic, just to help have a baby, then clean and everything. And then the examinations are done by the nurses. Mind you, we don't have doctors at that clinic, no. Our clinics, we don't have doctors, it's only nurses. So you are a pharmacist, you are uh, a gynecologist, you are an obstetrician, and then you do again the um, screening of the patients when they come. So we are grateful for all you are doing with us. It's not easy, but we are getting there, and we do it because you support us. And then you also go around to communities and do drama ministry to help explain how to fight disease and make hygiene, maybe share a little bit about that. Yes, um, we are talking of people that haven't been to school. Most of them were in different countries. And you know when you go into a different country, there are rules that you have to follow. Some don't even have uh, an access to some of the basics that they need to have. But some countries offer, but most of them they don't offer when you are a refugee. So um, some of them they haven't been to school because they've been away. So when they get back, everything is like it's not there. So we teach them through the drama because they cannot read, they cannot write. And again, when you call up a meeting the way you have come, and I'm just talking the way I'm talking, sometimes my accent, other people cannot hear it. Other people maybe will be busy doing something, like the mothers, they would have a baby and they, would, they want to breastfeed. Others, they want to use the bathroom. Others, So it wasn't effective. So we thought of a way in which we can be able to make them sit there, listen, and at least grasp something so that when they go back to their homes, they're able to implement. So that's how we came up with um, the drama where we put for example, if we want to teach on how to prevent malaria or child abuse, you've heard now there's a lot of abuse in our communities. Uh, our women are being raped, the girls are being raped on their way to school or on their way to fetch for water. So we try to put a script into a drama form where people, seven or eight people, they act on how to prevent malaria and then people around will be watching that. So that has really helped us to educate the community. And when they go back, because they still have, they play in, the, in their head what they watched, they go back and implement. And that has really helped us to keep our communities healthy. Now you do leadership training as well. Uh, and uh, I know you have a leadership training center, but I know you provide training. What types of courses do you offer? We have different courses that we offer. Um, the whole program has 17 leadership trainings that we do. And we are thankful all the 17. We get the sponsorship from here through your help, and then we are able to do them. These trainings help us a lot because the people that we deal with, they don't work. They are subsistence farmers. So uh, when we do the trainings for them, it really helps. Like we do the training that I talked about on the elders. The pastors are two. But for them to go to all the churches, it's not easy for them to do that. So we train the elders and the deacons. After training them, they become lay pastors so that they can be able to lead the churches in their communities. And then when we train them, they go back to different churches and be leaders there. And again, because they don't have an income, we train them into what we call um, sustainable development. They come back for another training where we train them to go and start laying maybe uh, chickens or maybe cattle. 
so that at least when they have those things, they sell, they can get a little something, and then be able to sustain them, their families. Because ourselves, we cannot pay them. The money we get is only for training. But for them to be sustained, it's not there. So to encourage them, to motivate them, we train them into maybe gardening, farming, and then when they go back, they start their own farming, and then they earn a little from that. We do literacy training. The training is because the people, they haven't been to school. Now when we elect them to be church elders, deacons, they need to, have to read the Bible. They need to sing. The way you do, you are singing and then you are reading. We don't have that. But we have the books, the hymn books. They want to read when we are singing. They don't know. So we do the literacy training where everyone is invited, those that are willing, to come and learn how to read and write. Then when they go back, we have a good community. We have good elders and deacons who are able to read the Bible. And again, we do HIV AIDS training for healthy. You know the pandemic in Africa is still high. So we are trying our best to do that awareness so that people can be able to get the treatment because we had people uh, not going to test because of discrimination. And again, other people um, just feel like it's not there. So we are trying to do the awareness that the disease is there and now they need to go to the hospitals. And if you are tested positive, get medication and then you start your life like that. We also do um, the skills training. Why we do the skills training, our elders still, they don't have an income. So we do the skills training where we teach them to be carpenters and then again to be um, builders. They build some of the churches. So that makes them to have an income so that they can continue leading our churches. Because you know, for you to lead a church, you need to have something. Like the way it is here, for sure, the offering that you give, it's divided into maybe to pay for electricity, to pay for water, to pay for pastors, and to run the church itself. So the little that we give them, it helps them to run their churches when they go back. So the skills training, the goodness is when you are trained, you are given the tools so that when you go back, you go and start carpentry with the tools that we have given you. So we have different trainings that we do. Um, it depends to which training that one wants to join in. So those are part of the trainings that we do. And again, gardening, uh, others want to do gardening, we do that one. And then we have um, for the mothers and health assistance because the hospitals are far apart. So still we need to train other people. When one is sick, they can easily go to that person and access the first aid that they can. Because um, for you to go to the hospital, for instance, if you have a fracture and you are bleeding and you have to go 20 miles away, with that bleeding, will you reach? You won't. So we train these people to be health assistants so that when there's an emergency, they can be able to attend to that before the person goes to the hospital. The birth attendants, again, we train them. We give them the birthing kits and when a woman is in labor, they attend to the woman before she goes to the hospital. Why we do that is because we want to save lives. Mm -hmm. So the women we train, it has helped us to bring the high maternal mortality rate we had. It was very high. So we are grateful for all you are doing with us to do all this training and support the community. Thank you so much. And uh, Sebra will be with us for the lunch. I hope you'll come back and hear some more details about all that. We, I've shared with you about the wells, the boreholes, um, and uh, there's so much more to tell about that. I just want to, before we finish today, what are just some ways Woodside can partner with you in your work? Um, first of all, I'm so grateful for all you are doing with us. You've done a lot. And uh, for you to be inviting us to come here, I'm humbled. Um, I know some of you, you remember I used to come with Nelson Zulu, the reverend. He's, he was the founder of the project. He passed on in 2018. We were here in 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we went back, he got sick two days after we went back to Africa. And he died within the, se the first week that we got back to Africa. Yeah. And he, it has had a big impact on the project because he was the founder and for us, who are behind him to pull to be where we are today, it's because of your support. You continue to support us, and you are continuing to be there for us. We are so grateful. 
And uh, we ask for your prayers to continue praying for us so that the project can be able to continue and help many people that are in the community. Continue supporting us. We need water still. There's still need for water because women still walk five, ten miles away from their home to get water. And we all know water is life. So if we have water close by, it helps our women not to walk far to go and go get water. And again, it helps them not to be raped. And the girls, again, they are able to go to a nearby place, get water, get a shower, run to school. So it really changes uh, many things in the community. So we really want you to help us still do the bohos in the communities so that they can be close by. And again, the schools. We have our students. They want to go to school, but the school is not there. So we need your help. Again, the churches. People are willing to worship the Lord the way we are doing here, but they don't have a structure. So we ask you to help us uh, build churches in Africa. We have an outcry of churches. So if you, we can partner, you can partner with us in different ways. I think the blue booklet that we have, it has different things that we want you to help us with. Uh, there are a lot of priorities, but let something that has caught your eye, then you can help whatever you can. We need bicycles for the elders because they need to go to these churches, but they are not mobile because they don't have a bicycle. So if you want to help with a bicycle, you are welcome to do that. Help us with the bicycle. If you want to do the church or partner with someone, you do the church for us, please, we humbly ask you to help us on that one. Schools and then the birthing kits for the women. We are still having women die on the way because of not having the clinics close by. So still when you give us some funds, we buy the supplies and then when we buy the supplies, we go and refill for the kits that we give them. So you save a life by buying a birthing kit. They are numerous. If you want more, you can read in the booklet. But otherwise, thank you so much for all you do with us. And thank you so much for inviting me to be with you today. I'm so grateful and humbled. Would you join me in a prayer for Seba and her work? Almighty God, thank you that you are the God of all nations and that in every place you raise up faithful leaders who answer your call to do your work. Please continue to bless and be with Seber, with Carlos, with her family, with all of them as they work to bring hope, good news, and life to the people of Tet Province in Mozambique. Give them strength, support, and the power of the Holy Spirit as they do your work and many, many people have both full lives and eternal life because of what she is doing. We pray all this in your strong name, Jesus. Amen.